I'm conflicted when it comes to incredibly strict parents. My parents were pretty hands-off when it came to my sister and me. As long as we got good grades, we were allowed to do almost anything we wanted without too much parental oversight. I firmly believe that this helped my sister and I determine who we are and what our values are because we were able to explore these topics without our parents meddling. On the other hand, this made an environment wherein we, mostly me, made mistakes that were entirely avoidable if we had more guidance besides, it's your life, you need to decide for yourself. As for stricter parents, I had a friend who lived with her grandparents and they were so strict she wasn't allowed to watch PG movies in The Simpsons, as if one whiff of Bart Simpson would have her blaspheming the Lord and breaking windows. Despite this, when she became a teenager and her mother regained custody, she rebelled in a major way that included drugs, drinking, and teenage pregnancy. Three things I didn't do in high school despite my parents letting me watch the wretched Lisa Simpson question authority and any rated R movie I wanted. I think it comes down to parents understanding their children. Some kids need rules and regulations, whereas others can thrive in a laissez-faire upbringing. Some need their parents to tell them that their school counselor, whom they've met exactly two times, doesn't know them well enough to suggest dorm life. Because if they knew you well enough, they know the dorms are the worst thing for an introvert. Marianne of the Babysitter's Club has an incredibly strict father, and frankly, he's ridiculous. Marianne is the one member of the BSC who doesn't need any restraints, but it takes Marianne to exhibit wisdom beyond her years just for her father to treat her like a basic 12-year-old. Let's get to it. This is Rereading My Childhood, The Babysitter's Club number 4, Marianne Saves the Day. The first thing we learn about Marianne's father is that he forces her to wear her hair in braids each day paired with a corduroy skirt and sweater combo set. The thought of my father choosing my outfit when I was in the seventh grade makes me both laugh and fill me with dread. Laugh because my father would hate it. Dread because he would make me wear a pair of Levi 501 jeans and a plain t-shirt with a pocket. This was his uniform and there would be no reason for him to alter it for his daughter. Anyway, Marianne's father really should have sent her to Catholic school if he wanted her to have such a constricting wardrobe. By the end of the first chapter, the BSC is having a fight, a common trope for the BSC. This time, it's about Christy accepting a job without asking the others first. They all blow up at each other and storm out of the meeting. Marianne's father also makes her eat dinner with him every night, including saying grace. My family tended to just eat at the same time because if we didn't, the food would be cold. The food is made when it's made and it's up to you to get to the table in time or heat it up later. During dinner, Marianne's father is a lawyer and he says that the case he's working on is of the utmost importance. The case is interesting because it demonstrates the extreme importance of honesty in business dealings, he said finally. Always remember that, Marianne. Be scrupulously honest and fair. It will serve you in good stead. Yeah, okay, Mr. Spear. Be honest, but if you really want to get ahead in business, you should open a bunch of businesses, don't pay your contractors, declare bankruptcy, create a fake college to swindle well-meaning people out of their money, get loans from Germany, be in the pocket of Russia, and then become president. I'm not talking about any real-world case in particular. After dinner, Marianne sees her room and remarks that it looks like the room of a child. It's pink and white, she has nursery rhyme pictures on the wall framed in pink, and pink curtains. Mr. Spear can't be that smart if he thinks that's an appropriate room for Marianne, let alone any human being with sight. Actually, even the blind shouldn't be subjected to that. I would call CPS on behalf of the blind person. The next day at school, the BSC is still fractured. Each member refuses to talk to the others. Marianne attempts to say hello, but they just ignore her. At lunch, Marianne is forced to sit by herself, but the new kid asks if she can sit with the braided wallflower. This is the introduction of Don Schaefer, a future BSC member. Marianne is ecstatic to have someone to sit with her. Dawn asks her where her regular friends are, and Marianne tells her that they're all sick. Yup, that's not suspicious at all. All my friends are sick except me. I didn't do anything to make them sick. They were like that when I found them, I swear. Marianne tells Dawn about all the weirdos in Stony Brook Middle School. I mention this because I need everyone to know that there's a kid named Alexander Kurtzman who wears a three-piece suit to middle school. Let me repeat that. There's a kid at Stony Brook Middle School who wears a three-piece suit. In middle school. I've been to middle school. It's a miracle this kid doesn't get beaten up in Dog Alley every day. Anyway, Dawn invites Marianne over to her house. Dawn has a VCR, so how could Marianne say no? Dawn's parents just got divorced and her mother grew up in Stony Brook, so she moved her daughter, Dawn, and her son, Jeff, across the country to an old farmhouse in her hometown. That's a pretty extreme thing to do after a divorce. I hate you so much I'm leaving beautiful California with its theme parks and culture for a town that is suspicious of black people when they move in. The girls watch The Parent Trap. The Haley Mills version, I'm assuming. The one where they make sure the girls are always standing on opposite sides of the screen. 
Afterwards, Marianne has her BSC meeting. To call it frosty would be an understatement. Christy doesn't even show up to her own damn club. She claims she's sick. Stacy, Claudia, and Marianne distribute the jobs, but it's not in the friendly manner that the club is accustomed to. When Marianne leaves, she looks back at Claudia's window. Marianne waves, and Claudia, quote, flashed her a hopeful smile and waved back. Marianne goes back to Claudia's house and leaves an apology note for Claudia with Mimi. Claudia calls her, and the girls make up, but the peace is only temporary. Marianne goes to talk to Christy at school. If the club can't get along, they have to figure out how to run it. Christy comes up with the idea that one girl goes to the meeting and takes any jobs that she can immediately and calls around to the other members if she can't. Dawn comes up and Marianne takes the opportunity to invite her over. Christy is flabbergasted because Marianne only invites Christy over. To get back at her, Christy announces that she can stay out babysitting until 10 on weekends and 9.30 on weeknights, further cementing Marianne's position as the baby of the BSC. Marianne sits for the Preziosos. There are a few paragraphs about these freaks, including notes that Mrs. Preziosa wears cocktail dresses wherever she goes and buys monogrammed handkerchiefs and suits for Mr. Prezioso. She also has a daughter whom she dresses like a porcelain doll. When Jenny says that she likes Marianne's skirt, Mrs. Prezioso says to her daughter, It's a very pretty skirt, I'm sure, but not as pretty as my little angel in her brand new dress. Mrs. Prezioso's first name must be Karen. It's actually Madeline, but I refuse to call her that. It's clearly Karen. Jenny goes through Marianne's kid kit and inspects the color forms. Don't worry, I brought some chloroform. Pleasant dreams. There. You idiot! Those are color forms! <laughs> she eventually settles on one of those coloring books where you put water over the page and magically dull colors appear. It takes the choice out of coloring. After the babysitting job, Marianne asks her father if she could stay out later. Predictably, he says no. Marianne continues. I'd like to be allowed to choose my own clothes. I'd like to take my hair out of these braids. I'd like to wear nail polish and stockings and lipstick. And if a boy ever asked me to go to the movies or something, I'd like to be able to say yes without even checking with you first. You know what? Sometimes you don't seem like my father to me. You seem like my jailer. These requests are perfectly reasonable, but not to old man Spear. It does not go well. You can't reason with conservatives. They don't listen to reason. They only care unless it directly affects them. And even then, they'll just get a secret abortion for their mistress. Marianne meets with Mimi and asks her what to do with her father. She basically tells Marianne to try and find another way. In the process, she calls Marianne, my Marianne. Claudia overhears this and says, but I'm the only one you call yours. Marianne and Claudia's tentative truce is clearly over. Mrs. Newton invites the entire BSC to help with Jamie Newton's fourth birthday party. Marianne is also forced to ask Christy if they want to sit for the Pikes. Christy doesn't want to work with Marianne, so Marianne says she'll get her new friend Dawn to sit with her. Christy relents and agrees to do the job because the only thing she can stand more than her former best friend is a babysitting job going to someone outside the BSC babysitting monopoly. At the Pikes, Christy and Marianne speak through Mallory. Then they play telephone followed by a play. The suggestions for what play they should put on include Peter Rabbit, The Phantom Tollbooth, and Chuck Norris. What the hell is Chuck Norris, Adam? Huh? You just do bad karate while wearing a hat? Or do you try to sell exercise equipment? The next day, Dawn invites Marianne over. They venture deep into Mr. Spears' yearbooks, looking for Mrs. Schaefer, or Miss Porter, as that's her maiden name. It seems that their parents knew each other in high school and may have dated. Well, at least they went to prom together. Marianne sits for the Preziosas again. This time, they're going to a basketball game in a suit and a cocktail dress. These two seriously subscribe to the axiom, it's better to be overdressed than underdressed. Jenny is quite lethargic all afternoon and falls asleep on the couch. Marianne notices that Jenny is hot and mumbles when Marianne tries to wake her up. She takes Jenny's temperature and it's 104. She calls Jenny's doctor and leaves a message. She calls the Pikes. Nothing. She calls her father. Nope. The next door neighbors. What? Those nameless no faces? Do you think some no faces are going to help Marianne? It's Dawn who comes to assist Marianne. She suggests they call 911 and ask them for advice. The operator sends an ambulance. In the meantime, Dawn makes a cold compress and gets Jenny's coat while Marianne calls the gym and leaves a message for the Preziosos. When they get to the hospital, it turns out Jenny has strep throat. The Preziosos arrived. The gym was paging them for a while before they arrived and heard the announcement. They immediately went back to Stony Brook. Mr. Prezioso drives Marianne and Don home and pays them $10 each. A fact that Marianne is very excited about. 
Those $10 is the spending power of $20 today. That's pretty good for half a night of babysitting. Marianne finally tells Don what has been going on with the other members of the BSC. Don is upset because Marianne originally claimed that all of her friends were sick, starting the friendship on a lie. Now Don is mad at her also. Okay, Don, it's not like Marianne said she's a vegan just to impress Don, but it turns out she just loves bacon and the taste of death. Marianne tells her father what happened with the Preziosos after they call later to update Marianne. Then he makes a weird apology. But 12 means different things for different people. It's like clothes. You can put a certain shirt on one person and he looks fabulous. Then you put a shirt on someone else and that person looks awful. It's the same way with age. It depends on how you wear it or carry it. That's a convoluted way of saying that people are different. All that so Marianne can finally wear the clothes she wants, decorate her room in a way befitting someone over the age of four, and she doesn't have to wear her hair in braids. In the BSC notebook, Stacy remarks that the fight is stupid and has been going on for a month, but that doesn't stop the BSC from almost ruining Jamie's birthday party. Marianne steps on Christy's foot and overpours a drink for the BSC president. Christy cleans up the mess and throws the napkin in Stacy's face. Then Stacy smashes the napkin in Claudia's face. This causes Jamie to cry, and the girls realize that they almost ruined Jamie's party if it wasn't for Mrs. Newton. The rest of the party goes fine. The girls have yet another emergency meeting at Claudia's house after the party, and we have the big apology scene where they all recognize their pettiness and makeup. Marianne also makes up with Don, and Marianne's father even lets Marianne have a BSC party at her house to formally ask Don to join the BSC. However, Mr. Spear insists that the girls eat dinner together. With him. During the party. I can think of a million things I'd rather do than have dinner with a group of 12-year-olds. I don't care what tradition I have. He is a grown-ass man, and his daughter deserves a little privacy. During the dinner, the BSC formally invites Don to join the club. After all that, in order for Mr. Spear to treat his daughter like the responsible person she is, all Marianne had to do was save a little girl's life. I'm not a parent, but that's a ridiculous lesson. She has to be extraordinary just to be treated as ordinary. No one should be held up to this standard. I mean, no one. Mr. Spear is entirely too strict. My childhood best friend's grandparents were also too strict, but her mother wasn't strict enough. Maybe Mr. Spear should take his own apology to heart. Making sweeping rules for your child is a good way to ensure your child won't speak to you when they get older. But not having enough boundaries can create undue stress on a child, either by making avoidable mistakes or detrimental life decisions. The key must be in knowing your child, who they are and their priorities and proclivities, in order to create appropriate boundaries. But that would require parents to actually speak to their child as if they're equals. And who has time for that? <laughs> oh, God. We're doomed.